Maybe there's nothing else to shrine curse technique than the slashes and flames. What did Sakuna mean when he told curses wouldn't understand? There are still so many mysteries about shrine. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, like, I have definitely um, uh, talked a little bit um, about Fuga in the reaction stream. Um, I mean, it's like, don't get me wrong. I'm not mad at it, right? Not mad at it one bit. What I would say is a little underwhelming um, is to me the fact that it was theorized that Fuga would be so much more. And you can't argue that. You'll never be able to argue that to me. We're going to start the chapter review for sure. Um, the attack of furnace open or divine flame, stove open, whatever the hell you want to call it. I personally say what you will about John Weary. I think divine flame is the coolest option out of all the three. I understand we want to stick to the Sakuna chef aspect with furnace or stove or whatever, but... I don't care. I'm calling it Divine Flame. Um, Six from Tokyo also coined the nice term Divine Furnace, which I also think is a pretty good one as well. Um, I just think Divine Flame sounds the coolest, um, and it can still stick with the chef vibe if, 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 you, if you want to. Um, but either way, um, it's that why did we censor Divine Flame, right? Why did we censor that word? The only reason we censored that word was to add mystery, add suspicion, to make people speculate, to make people theorize about, oh my god, what did Sakuna do? I mean, think about some of the theories that we were coming up with, right? Like, the most, the best theory that I liked was Quirkless Shinobi's theory of the, the it opening the cursed realm and Sakuna being able to reconstruct a curse technique after understanding it enough and Sakuna was able to reconstruct Jogo's flame ability but no just conveniently enough Sakuna also had flame abilities um when he fought Jogo and it was just uh very convenient um and then we put the black box there to again make us think oh my god what did he do like think about some of the speculation this is one of the times that I think all of the speculation and all of the big theories that we had for like two to three years in regards to Fuga in general is pretty valid. I I, I think Kashimo, you could say, sure, he was overhyped, you know, what blah, blah, blah. We, he had a reason to have all these theories surrounding him. I know there's a lot of different aspects of that, but really wholeheartedly stop and think to yourself for a moment. Fuga's speculation was purposeful. We were, that was the whole reason of the black box was meant for us to be like, what the hell is going on? When ultimately at the end of the day, it was just the flame all along. There was no fucking secret. There was no reason to censor furnace or stove other than to make us think there was more to the attack than met the eye. That's pretty much what it came down to, to me. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's another take you could have. I'd be willing to hear any other argument in regards to it. I'm sure there's people that don't mind the censorship or think I'm just being nitpicky. But the thing is, is like there, there was a bunch of speculation. I even said to myself that it might just be the fire arrow to begin with. Sure, that's fine. I'm OK with that. My issue is, is again, why did you censor it? There is no point. There was no point other than to make it seem like Sakuna had more than he actually did. And then at the very end moment at the 11th hour, it's revealed that, oh, actually, it's just a fire arrow. That's all I can do, which again, sure, that's fine. But the secret was that there was no secret. And that's and, and that's fair. But to be fair, I feel like we're partly to blame for raising the hype. I completely agree with that. Again, we were very much theorizing and over speculating and over hyping what the fire era would end up being in the long run and what it could be i i don't doubt that at all but my problem is is that it was intentionally designed to be something that we speculated and over theorized about for years 
if this was something like Kashimo, where the fandom completely did it to themselves, then I'm then I understand that and I can call that out like it is. But the fandom didn't just make Fuga up to be this grand, amazing thing. It was specifically put in the story to to appear as such. Now, this is one of those things, and I'm going to bring up Kung Fu Panda because I love Kung Fu Panda. In Kung Fu Panda 2, a plot, a major plot point, um, or a major, it, it, I think it's actually Kung Fu Panda 1. Um, the secret is that there is no secret, um, is a big plot point. Um, even Mr. Ping, uh, Poe's dad, um, mentions this, right? Um, where, like, he tells everyone that there's a secret ingredient to his noodles, but there isn't any secret ingredient to his noodles. He just makes the best noodles that he can, and if people like him, oh shit, that's awesome. Um, but just by telling people that there's a secret, it inspires that mystery. You're like, oh wow, why is this so good? Oh my god, I have to keep coming back and try and figure it out. I can't recreate it when, like, the secret is that there is no secret. There is no secret ingredient. It's just, they're just good fucking noodles. And, and like in that instance, for that specific moment, I'm okay with that, right? Because like that builds character development for Ho. And it, it, it like it, it like to look within yourself, you know, there doesn't need to be a secret ingredient. You can be good always. You don't need that special secret power to be your best self. You can just be your best self, right? That's the point of that sense. In this sense, this is Mr. Ping is just, this is like, so this is like Mr. Ping is doing the exact same thing, but the noodles fucking suck. They're garbage dog water. And Mr. Ping is telling you that they make you smarter every bowl that you eat. That's the, that's the opposite. That's the opposite. You are training for the fucking triathlon of fucking intellectual fucking marketplace. I don't know, competition, whatever the fuck they have. The, what, you're, you're, you're going to the Hunger Games to, and the Hunger Games is one big quiz, like the SATs, and the winner gets to, you know, win a Nobel Prize or some shit, right? You are training to be the smartest person in the world. And then Mr. Ping is feeding you these things. And then at the end of it, when you go, when you're just about to walk on the stage and go on, 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 on stage and compete, Mr. Ping goes, Hey, just so you know, there was no secret ingredient that made you smarter. All right. Good luck. Peace. And he, he sets you off on stage and walks away. What the, you'd be like, what the fuck? In that sense. It doesn't, it doesn't, it, you're not being helped by knowing there's no secret. You're just like, oh, well, okay, fuck. That's how I feel. I don't know if that was a good analogy. That might've been wrong, but either way. Or am I saying Sakuna still hasn't gone all out, made it seem like Sakuna still has some techniques to reveal? Um, yeah, I mean, it's also my disappointment probably a little bit that Sakuna had literally nothing to reveal this entire time. We've been speculating for like 20, 30 chapters that Sakuna was going to show us something new. And he literally showed us nothing new uh, besides what Megami should have been able to do. <laughs> That's literally the only new thing. The only new things that Sakuna showed us were Megami's abilities, which is just, I mean, I can say there's a little bit of disappointment in that. I would have liked, I would have liked Divine Flame to be a little bit more than it was. Am I upset and like gonna cry over the fact that it's just the fire arrow? No, the fire arrow is still a very menacing fucking ability. And it's basically Sakuna's equivalent to Hollow Purple. And I won't deny that I love the parallel, right, of Gojo. He has his neutral limitless, but he has red, blue, Hollow Purple. Uh, and his domain expansion. Sakuna, cleave, dismantle, fuga, domain expansion, right? And then he has his innate ability to, sure, eat people or whatever, or be a cursed object, whatever the fuck you want to consider that. But, like, I do like the parallel between those two characters, that they both have two versions of their innate technique, and then the main ability that that is a combination of everything. So, I, I'm cool with that, right? I'm, I'm, I'm cool with it not mad at it am i disappointed yeah a little bit but that's okay it's not my story i'm not writing it that's fine if gege just wants him to have the fire arrow then god damn it gege just lets him have the fire arrow and that's fine you know what 
Sakuna at this fucking point is way too powerful anyway. Let's be honest. Sakuna is literally like when the gap between the top of the verse and like the like grade one verse, like special grade and regular grade are like so the gap is so high. It's so big. It's like insane. So you know what? Sakuna doesn't need anything more. Let's be real. <laughs> Uh, Shadow Hunter, thank you for the dono. I appreciate you. Uh, I'm starting to think Hikari will not fight Sakuna, and even even if he does, he'll fight like the weakest version. Hold you to that number. I'm gonna hold you to that number. Watch Sakuna pulls out his twins curse technique. <laughs> now that would be an interesting development. So. We've yapped a lot about Sakuna here. We've yapped a lot about Sakuna here. But I think it's time to focus on what's important and have priorities. Chapter 259 brought to us the death of best brother Choso. Choso is no longer with us. He has been defeated completely and killed by the fire arrow potentially along with everyone else a lot of people are hurt by this <laughs> I have seen I have seen the struggle and I have seen the sadness everywhere it's very sad it's very sad um, but you know what in my honest opinion I don't think Choso could have been taken out in, in another in any other better way in any other better way. Um, I think Choso sacrificing himself for Yuji um, is the perfect end to his character. I would have, as much as I said before, I would have loved to have seen um, the uh, Yuji, uh, Yuji Choso Toto, you know, team up. I am always gonna prefer Choso going out this way. But let me know, that's a perfect poll. Are you happy with Choso's ending? Let's poll the community. Yes or no? Are you happy with Choso's ending? Take the image off screen for a little bit just so we can show the poll results. <clears throat> Every time Yuji loses a brother, a new one shows up. The law of equivalent exchange. The law of equivalent exchange. <laughs> uh, but the reason why I say I think this is the best possible ending that Choso could have gotten um, is, I mean, at this point, Choso really had nothing, um, you know, left uh, to do in the story. Um, Choso's power level had far been eclipsed, unfortunately. Um, I think that's pretty clear. Uh, you can see with just how easily he gets, you know, tossed aside in the final fight with Sakuna. Uh, immediately as soon as Choso's on the battlefield, Sakuna picks Choso out as the weakest link. Compared to Eno, by the way. Imagine that, like, Choso immediately got fucking pierced through the stomach by Sakuna on, on, on introductions. Um, maybe you could say that Sakuna went for Chosa because he knew it would hurt Yuji the most. That's a that's a big possibility. But Choso's basically taken out of the game right after that point, um, at least until he comes back later um, with everyone kind of jumping in uh, to help Yuji um, when Sakuna, when, when Miguel and LaRue come back in, right? Um, and even then, Sakuna hits Choso with a Black Flash and probably would have killed Choso there if Choso didn't use the Blood Armor to protect him against that fucking uh, another stab, right? Choso was very much outmatched in this fight. Um, he was essentially just a liability. Um, and Choso felt that way for sure. Whether you want to believe that Choso was a liability and Choso did enough in, in the fight or not, um, Choso felt that way for sure. Um, you also see Choso's um, incompetence or Choso's inferiority complex showing because he wasn't able to teach Yuji to the best of his ability. 
he really wasn't able to teach Yuji anything. And I know I saw a lot of comments, and I want to make this clear. I saw a lot of comments that Yuji did not learn Supernova. Um, I, I think it's actually directly stated in this chapter that Kamo says it's not. It it doesn't make sense for Yuji to learn Supernova. Yuji does have the bursting blood. He does have the ability to make his blood explode or cause damage. We do see that. Um, I think that's more of an extension of Kechizu's blood ability than it is Supernova. Remember, Supernova is a basically like a shotgun pellet blast um, through using Convergence. Yuji cannot converge. Yuji cannot use Convergence. It's specifically mentioned um, that he can't. Um, so... I got a lot of comments that were like, uh, Choso did teach Yuji something. Choso taught Yuji Supernova. Yuji didn't teach, um, Choso didn't teach Yuji anything. Sad, as sad as it is. Um, Kamo taught Yuji everything. And Choso felt that inferiority um, by not being able to teach Yuji anything of blood manipulation. Yuki literally kept Choso alive because she said he had more to do. He died as a, he died as a curse fighting Kenjaku and was left to live and and help Yuji, right? So, how shitty do you think it made Choso feel that he had the survivor's guilt of not dying with Yuki or fighting Kenjaku like Choso had already resolved to do so, right? Can, like... Cho let, let's remember that in the star in the um in the tomb of the star fight choso was fully resolved to die fighting kenjaku that is how choso wanted to die as a human yuki robbed him of that right and choso not only had the survivor's guilt of yuki dying and kenjaku still being alive so choso not only feeling like he failed in that sense but you also have choso who was then left alive to supposedly help his brother and he couldn't even do that you know, it, he couldn't even do that. Um, so Choso did the only thing that he knew possible. Choso did the only thing that he knew he possibly could do. And that was sacrifice himself to save Yuji from this instant death domain. We get it confirmed as well. Toto would not have been able to save Yuji or Choso. The two of them were too close to the middle of the domain expansion in order to actually solve anything, right? Um, Toto would not have been able to save them with the Boogie Woogie, even if he wanted to. Yuji would have for sure died. Um, so Choso did what he felt was best. Um, he sacrificed himself completely, as we see in the panel on screen. He sacrificed everything that he knew, um, his entire life, all his cursed energy, all his blood, everything that he possibly could um, to save the only person that made him human. The only reason that the only thing that left him as a human being and left his mark as a human being on society was Itadori Yuji and the brotherhood that he shared with his death paintings. Even though they were all brothers tied by blood and twisted fate terrible fucking awful kenjaku it was that 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 kept them going and sadly it was all that choso could do for yuji in this moment even in the final fight for sakuna even with a month time skip and everything choso could do he wasn't able to teach yuji any kind of blood manipulation he wasn't able to help Yuji in the fight against Sukuna. He got taken out multiple times. This was all he could do, was give his life for his brother. And that's, all while very sad, it shows how much Yuji truly meant to Choso and how much Choso was willing to do for his brother. As the older brother, he gave it all up. Now, I did see a lot of people upset in regards to why was this all-powerful ability that was said to be Sakuna's ultimate attack that is probably one of the strongest attacks we've ever gotten in the entire series. Why? Why, why, why would Choso be able to block it? 
And in that instance, I remind you of Bird Strike. I remind you of Mei Mei's ability to kamikaze a bird into a special grade's curse spirit. Mei Mei specifically mentions that giving your entire life as a binding vow, giving everything you have into one Jujutsu move makes it more powerful than an inconceivably, you know, measurable. That, that doesn't even make sense. More powerful, that, more powerful than can be measured. I don't even think that makes sense, but you get what I'm saying. The giving your life and uh, a final move of desperation is everything. So to everyone that's like, oh, no one's using binding vows or no one's, uh, you know, Sakuna's not trying when he uses binding vows. Here's this right here that proves as such. By using everything he could, Joso was able to save Yuji from the instantaneous guaranteed death of Malevolent Shrine. And I think, if anything, It just makes Choso's end and sacrifice of Yuji so much more real and just so much sadder. But Choso did everything he could for his brother to the very end. And without Choso, without Yuki saving Choso, everyone most likely would have died here and they would have lost against Sakuna. But thankfully, brotherly love saves everything. And I'm happy to see that uh, that was a binding vow confirmed. It's not specifically stated, but the fact that Choso dies and gives his life, I think it's pretty clear. Um, but yeah, out of 132 votes, uh, we have 82% of people that are happy with Choso's ending. The other 18%, I'm not sure if they're just sad in general uh, because Choso's gone. Um, but... I, again, like I said, I think Choso dying here um, is very poetic. I think it makes the absolute most sense for him to go. His story relevance was kind of, you know, fading. And again, he was just kind of getting cooked back and forth uh, in the final fight in Shinjuku show. So it's good that he was able to do something that at least mattered. Now, the one thing that I think is very interesting to note that I that I that isn't lost on me, right? It's not lost on me at all. Is the fact that Sakuna and Yuji, while we know, you know, there's so many parallels, they're all so similar, yada yada yada, all that stuff. What I think is interesting about Choso giving his life here. And of course, the fact that we know Toto shows up later to help Yuji in his moment of desperation. I think one of the most interesting things uh, to talk about is Sakuna was able to survive starvation, become this decrepit, deformed monster of a sorcerer and gain all of this energy by sacrificing everything, right? by sacrificing everything and everyone and carving his own path, no matter what he himself, you know what I mean? You guys get me, right? Sakuna's very first ever action towards this path was devouring his brother in the womb. Sakuna, to achieve all of this, tossed aside brotherhood from the very beginning. And on the flip side, we have someone like Yuji, who every step of the way has grown developed and now in the 11th hour in the most desperate moment ever survives guaranteed death thanks to his brother some brothers he got through blood some he got through other means but brothers none the same Ito Grandpa Itadori's words ring in my ears in this moment here because I think die surrounded by good people. Now, whether we want Yuji to die or not, and I don't think Yuji is dying, I think it says a lot um, to what has brought Yuji to this point. Yuji alone is a great content, uh, contestant in Jujutsu Sorcery. 
Jujutsu Kaisen as a story. He's a great main protagonist. I love him. He moves the story along. He's a great fighter, um, and he does the best he can. But every single time Yuji's been faced with a, a, in, a, in an indomitable situation against all odds, Yuji's always had help. And that's not a bad thing. That's why I say Toto's fought when Yuji fought Hanami, Toto was there. When Yuji fought Mahito, Toto was there. And in the final moment against the final villain, Toto is there for Yuji. But not just Toto, Choso is also there for Yuji. And now, Choso died, he's dead. Um, I hope that Choso passed on his spirit and Kachizu and Esso all as well onto Yuji so that way all 10 death paintings are resonating in one vessel. I would absolutely love that. I'm not sure by how Choso died if Yuji didn't get any of Choso's power or anything. I would like him to. That'd be great. But even if he didn't, either way, Choso will always be with Yuji in spirit. And so will Esso and Kachizu. So in a sense, Yuji will never be alone no matter what. Um, but also Toto is there to help Yuji in his time of need and also back Yuji up against Sakuna in this final moment in the final battle. I will not ever shy away from admitting that Yuji having brothers by his side always and having brotherhood be the reason that he not only just survived this Fuga, but has the will to continue fighting this fight even though everyone might be dead is what may give Yuji the, the advantage over Sukuna in the long run. What might give Yuji the battle of attrition win that we so desperately need. Yuji, always having people around him, will always beat Sukuna, whose desire was to do everything himself. I think of Final Fantasy 16 um, a lot, because that one that was an amazing game, if you haven't played it, or if you're holding off on playing it, I highly recommend it. It was such a great, amazing adventure playing that game. Um, uh, one major theme at the end of the game, not to spoil it, um, is that, you know, there are two different types of gods, right? There are two different types of people that get praise. There is the god that gets praised through fear, gets praised through revere. You know, he is a worship god because he's a malevolent god and he will kill you if you go against him. You know, all, all of beings are his puppet. But there's another god who becomes a god based off prayer, who comes a god based off of reliability, who becomes a god based off of being there for the people that do pray for them and worship them, all of that stuff, right? There are two different types of god. There is a there's a benevolent god um, who actually does the best for their people, and then there's an awful god who considers the people their playthings. The god who receives prayers and actually has the people's willing and the people's trust and everything and the people and is becomes a god through benevolence and love rather than becoming a god through fear will always beat the god who becomes a god through fear um and i think this is a great parallel because yuji is that benevolent god who came up and grew through support and constantly building connections with other people and gaining strength through the connections that he's built where you have Sukuna, who granted is one of the strongest people in the world. I will never deny that Sukuna is the peak of Jujutsu sorcery. He's always done it alone. And granted, while that speaks volumes for how strong Sukuna is, in the long run, if Sukuna was facing the odds that Yuji just was and was faced against a domain expansion where he could not die, um, where he had to die, I'm sorry. If Sukuna could not do it on his own, Sukuna's dead. Whereas Yuji... Even though Yuji can't do it on his own, Yuji's never alone. Yuji has his brothers. And maybe things would have been different if Sukuna kept his brother. Maybe Sukuna would have lived. Maybe Sukuna wouldn't have died of starvation if he ate his brother. He didn't even give it a chance. Maybe Sukuna and his brother could have changed the world, done something great. You know, two brothers, you know? But either way, I, I, I think getting off of Choso um, and moving on to Toto... Um, what a wild uh, couple of words that was that I just said. Um, I think it, it, it's interesting, and I wanted to really point out the theme of brotherhood um, in this moment here, because it's very important, um, and it really shows the direct separation um, of Yuji and Sukuna, and why Yuji was always destined to surpass Sukuna.
The panel makes it look like Sakuna's about to grab Yuji's head. Yo, it does. He's going to pluck it right off. It also shows no matter blood or stranger, you can have bonds deeper than twins. Super duper true. Yuji and Toto are brothers from another mother, for sure, without a fucking doubt. And it also speaks volumes again, just like how important it is to have support in those trying moments. Because again, even though Yuji has grown a significant amount since Shibuya, right? Yuji has grown a lot since being the character that watched Nanami and Nobura die and then had an entire mental breakdown and had to be picked up by Toto. Yuji's come a long and far away, and I've talked a lot about that a lot um, when it came to Higuruma dying in front of him and Yuji still having the um, the power to carry on and fight. Yuji's resolve is very strong, and it's something that Sukuna made it now his mission to break down. And in this moment, as Yuji's overlooking the scorched earth and everything is settling, and it looks like everyone's dead but him that strong resolve i mean for anybody you have to imagine started to waver a bit again it really did because now he's all alone sakuna's still here and even though yuji knows in his heart of hearts he has to avenge choso and use the life that choso gave him to keep going. Yuji starts going, holy shit, this, this might be, this might be a battle we can't win. He starts having the same thoughts that Gojo does, you know? He starts going, wow, I, I, I might, I might lose. This might be it. But just like Shibuya incident, right in that moment, Toto's there to back him up. Toto's there to back his ass up by far. And it shows how much Yuji trusts someone like Toto. How much confidence Yuji has when he has someone like Toto next to him. A real brother, whether blood or not. Because even the words, most likely fine. They're probably fine. They might be fine. Whatever translation you're using here. Because again, Toto isn't sure if his boogie woogie plan's going to work. He has no idea if everyone is fine or not. And also, Yuji was not aware of the plan at all of how to save everyone from the domain expansion. Which I'll get into right after we talk about Toto being back. Um, but... In the moment where Toto doesn't even have time to explain what the hell was going on and what Toto even did to ensure everyone is most likely fine. Yuji goes, I'll believe him. It's all I can do right now. So it shows how much comfort and confidence having Toto by his side also instills in Yuji, right? They also have to imagine... Yuji knows that after using his domain expansion, Sakuna's going to be in don't, uh, curse technique burnout and have low output, which means, again, as I've said multiple times throughout the stream, Sakuna is literally at the lowest he's ever possibly been at. This is the state that they've been trying to get Sakuna into since the beginning of the Shinjuku showdown. So they cannot let this opportunity pass them by. It's time for the brothers to cook once again and holy shit uh, we've said so many times we want Toto to come back we've always said it I've been one of the biggest people that have been fighting for a Toto comeback for so long and uh, it's so great that we're finally getting it I would not have anyone come back to back Yuji up but Toto you bet your mother fucking ass Toto has the best support technique in Boogie Woogie that is still alive, by the way. 
Um, so we now get to see Yuji and Toto boogie woogie shenanigans against the king of motherfucking curses. Now, in regards to Toto, there's a couple of questions that Toto brings up immediately just by his arrival. That being said, I'm going to need to see some likes for Toto showing up. We got 227 viewers, 93 likes. We can get more likes on the stream for Toto arrival. Let's see the love for Toto. Let, let's give the spirit bomb of like buttons to Toto right here, right now. It really helps the stream. It helps the channel way more than you know. Um, and it really helps the YouTube algorithm because YouTube hates sending notifications out to people for some reason. I don't know why, but hey. So anyway, getting into Toto in particular, here's some of the things that I want to discuss in regards to Toto coming back, because as happy as I am that Toto has come back, I, I, th I think there are a couple things that we need to go over. One, through this flashback, we basically get the full concocted plan as to how everyone most likely is fine, <laughs> which is the idea that Toto would use Boogie Woogie um, to swap out some of Mei Mei's crows for the Jujutsu um, sorcerers that are stuck inside Sukuna's domain expansion, which is pretty much the, the best plan that they have to get people like Eno and everyone out of the instant death domain. Um, you know, it's literally the only option they have. However, there are a couple problems with this plan. One... That's a very large range. A very large range. Um, it's a 200 meter range. That's a lot, especially in Jujutsu Kaisen. That's far. So Boogie Woogie one has trouble working at that long of a range um, in which we see the results of that being that Toto can't even actually reach someone like Choso or Yuji in the domain because they're too far in the center. It's too large of a range that Toto can't even use Boogie Woogie on them. So they're, they're fucked. If Choso did not give up his life for Yuji, they would have died. So they were dying anyway. At least Choso gave his life up for Yuji. In regards to Ino and Miwa, they might be safe, sure. Um, however, Toto even admits himself that one sakuna's domain is instant death like instant death so first of all you're working against the odds that as soon as sakuna cast this malevolent shrine as well as the furnace open and divine flame it's most likely a wrap for everyone in the domain expansion anyway so you already have that odds going against you toto has to clap like three to four times as many times as he can um as quickly as he can in order to try and save everyone however even if he is able to do those claps there's no guarantee that it will save them because they might already be dead so toto admits that's one big flaw on top of the range issue you also have to imagine that the range issue is probably affecting the fact that because the claps are happening so quick that might also interfere with how fast it happens now, a lot of people are mentioning with the Boogie Woogie that I've seen that Maki has no cursed energy. Toto most likely requires cursed energy uh, to be inside inanimate objects um, in order to actually do uh, the, the clapping. By doing this, Toto needs to imbue his own cursed energy into the inanimate objects or have someone else imbue cursed energy into that inanimate object. We see that uh, Toto is able to do this with Playful Cloud. Um, Toto is also able to do, to do this with rocks and coat hangers that he throws at enemies to swap himself with. He just has to put cursed energy on that object. So there are a couple different ways Maki could have survived. You know, Miwa could have imbued Maki with cursed energy, letting Boogie Woogie occur. That just makes it even harder to save Maki. 
Um, we talked a little bit about this in the beginning of the stream, but it's also possible that um, just because Maki was touching Miwa, who has curse energy, Maki could have pu been pulled with Boogie Woogie. Or because Maki was holding Soul Split Katana, and a weapon with cursed energy, uh, she could have been pulled with Boogie Woogie. However, I don't agree with that because it's completely possible that uh, Boogie Woogie only works on that specific target, not whatever is holding that target. Um, which would mean that if, let's say, for example, you're holding, if let's say, for example, Toji is holding Playful Cloud, if Toto Boogie Woogies, he could in turn take Playful Cloud and disarm Toji entirely. So it's quite possible that another small failure in this Boogie Woogie Savior plan is that Maki is just kind of fucked and is going to be dead in the Fuga Dobain no matter what. What are the results of the Boogie Woogie plan? We don't know. We cannot tell. We have no idea. So um, that's one big thing in regards to Toto's Boogie Woogie. Another thing is we thought Toto's Boogie Woogie was dead. A lot of us theorized that Toto's Boogie Woogie was gone forever, right? That Toto's Boogie Woogie was not coming back. There was no chance it was going to come back. Mahito affected the soul to the point that Toto was completely fucked and lost his curse technique. Toto even surmises as such when he's unable to create an audience or an applause sound when he fucking like claps his nub and tricks Mahito. However, we do get small confirmation here in regards to it um, that Toto even admits that he's not even sure if Boogie Woogie is back. We see Toto got his hand reverse curse technique returned. Um, Toto's hand was revived, which again shows that you can regenerate limbs in, in Jujutsu Kaisen with output of reverse curse technique. Now, Shoko admits that certain people reject curse energy more than others. So that would explain why characters like Inumaki or Hana aren't able to have their arms regenerated, where characters like Hikari and Toto are able to have their limbs regenerated from Shoko. There's also the possibility that we talked about in the very beginning of stream, which Yuji um, soul swapping with Yuta gave Yuji the ability to output reverse curse technique, which by having Yuji understand the soul, Yuji was able to not only heal Toto's hand, but also return Boogie Woogie to a certain degree. However, I doubt that. And the reason why I doubt that is because Toto admits, which is the big other thing in regards to Toto's big boogie woogie plan and Toto coming back, is that Toto admits that he feels that Sakuna was clued in on all of the plans that they had against Sakuna because Yuji and Sakuna's souls were kept together for so long that their soul resonance actually leaked their plans to Sakuna. This could mean multiple different things. One, it's possible that that may be why Sakuna has had such an advantage and always been one step ahead of everyone's plans. Sakuna may not have known everything in regards to the plan, but he was able to so select small little thoughts and details from, uh, you know, the whatever Yuji was around in discussion. This could also just be a big precaution, right? This could be unreliable narration, right? This could be untrue. Sakuna... Because there's also uh, moments where Sakuna's like, what did you guys all do in this last month? So the, Sakuna does give um, indications that he wasn't aware of either anything or he just wasn't aware of everything that happened in the month time skip. Like I said, he could have been aware of small things, but not everything. Or Toto is just, again, taking full on precaution here and saying, hey, this could be true, but it might not be true. But let's not tell anyone about this. Viable option. This is coming from Toto's 530,000 IQ brain. So again, Toto's just built like that. It's possible Toto's just a precautious guy. But either way, this is a complete um, explanation as to why Toto was one, probably out of the culling game completely. Because I know I saw a lot of people being like, oh, Toto was just MIA. Gege, why did Toto, why did Gege decide to bring Toto back now? Um, it's possible Toto just now recovered. Because even in this conversation alone, Toto admits he doesn't even know how well Boogie Woogie will work. Yep. So, either way. 
awesome, awesome. Um, I'm just happy that Toto is back. While there are a lot of things that we probably need answers to, and there was a lot of small bits of information that were leaked that kind of make me head tilt. Again, I'm just happy Big Brother Toto is back. And again, I know a lot of people um, may not think so, um, but I think Toto is for sure the complete indication that we are in the end game of the Sakuna fight. This is the final phase of the Sakuna fight. Toto has arrived. And if Toto's arrival means anything, it means we're entering the last steps of the climactic battle of the arc. But yeah, I mean, uh, amazing chapter. Um, the equivalent exchange of, of losing Choso to gain Toto back was a sad trade-off, but a trade-off nonetheless. The Gion Shoja Bells ring once more.